Okay. Great. Okay, guys, let's let's t turn to Psalm 33. And oh, right here. So let's start at verse six. And this will kind of tell you a little bit where we're going to be headed today. Okay. Let's follow along with me, and I'll read with you. Okay. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the Lord stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Let's think about that. For he spoke, God spoke, and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So let's let, let's let that be our prayer tonight, guys, okay? That God speaks, and we listen, and we do. Okay, that's what we want to have done. Okay. Uh, all right. How many of you guys were here a f about a month ago? If you, any of you guys can remember a month ago when we uh, met before in this room. Anybody here still from that? Okay. We're going to review just a little briefly real quick, okay? But I won't test you to see how much you can remember. Because I know when I was your age, I couldn't remember anything for a week, let alone a month. Okay? But we'll just cover a couple things and see what we've got. Now, you remember we talked about science, right? And we talked about faith. And we said that science was, pretend you weren't here th last time. Who can tell me something about science? Who had science class? And you guys have science class? You have science class? What do you do in science class? Learn about stuff? Good start. Okay. How is science class different than history class? Good. You can tell me. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. Science class you learn about science. History class you learn about history. That's pretty good. That'll make a good essay for your, your class. Okay, in science class we measure things, right? We study the physical world. We study properties of physical things. We talk about measuring. We talk about uh, hypotheses and other big words like that. History class we talk about things that have happened. English class we study um, about writing. But in science class we tend to measure things. And it has a certain magic, right? If, if you guys were going to do bad in the class, which class would be least important to you? What would you say? What would English? Okay, what do you think? English? Math? You don't like math? Uh, uh, which, which one don't you like? Art? Okay. Well, science is real important. I'll bet a lot of your moms and dads make, living, make a living by knowing science really well. So in our culture, science is really important because science is how we explain things how we make a living, okay? How about faith? Can someone tell me anything about faith? What is faith? Anybody know um, any examples of faith that you guys know? Who's ridden in an airplane? Everybody, right? Does that take any faith? Faith in what? The pilot? What else? How about the engineer that made the plane, right? What if the engineer doesn't study and he designs the plane? What would happen? Phew, that's right. That's what you say. That'd be trouble, right? You'd be on the news. That wouldn't be good. So we talked about how science and faith are different because science in our culture tends to have a certain authority and faith Sometimes we think, well, that's just something you believe. You don't have to have evidence for that. But we're going to look at whether that's really true or not. One of the things that we're interested in is, as believers, as Christians, we would like to have a reason for what it is that we believe. And a while back, people at Time Magazine asked us, is God dead? Is there any evidence for God? And we're going to look at some of those things. Now, those of you who were here last time, bear with me, because I just want to bring out a couple of ideas, and we're going to build on them today. 
The first one was that science is not the ultimate authority for anything. Okay, why is that? Because science is only a tool. Science is not a philosophy you can build your life from. Science does not necessarily even point to truth. But science is a tool that we can use that can be very useful and that uh, is important for us to learn about. So you guys still have to study. One of the ways that we can kind of look at this, at the limitations of science, is by thinking about a car. Okay, we talked about a Model T car. You guys said this is an old antique car. And we can learn about the car. We can take it apart and see what's inside. We can study the motor. And we can learn about the compression ratio inside the pistons. We can learn what kind of fuel it can use, how much oxygen it needs, how much power it can make. And we can learn all about the mechanism of the car. We can know how it works. Does that mean there was no such person as Mr. Ford? Because we can describe how it works, does that mean that there's no one who designed it? I would say that the more we know about something, the more we can be sure that there was a designer because this thing couldn't occur by itself. Last time we talked about a birthday cake too. It just so happens my birthday is, is this week. Okay, who else has a birthday this week? You do? Who, do, who does? Stefan Curdy. Oh, okay, very good, okay. So you might have an idea what this cake is, but we're, if we were to analyze this cake with using scientific methods, suppose we got our microscopes out and we said, we're going to find out everything there is to know about this cake. And I'm going to call my three smartest friends to come and tell me everything about this cake. I'm going to analyze it by science so we can get to the ultimate reality behind this cake. I would call my friend the chemist, right? And the chemist would go to this cake and start analyzing the cake. Who's had chemistry class? Right. What do you do in chemistry class? Do you have lab? So what do you get to do in your lab? Couldn't make anything? You get a test tube, right? Put some stuff in, make some colors? Yeah. Okay. So our friends, when you guys get to college, you'll have to do s uh, some experiments where you actually have to determine what it is that they give you okay so this is what uh, your friend would do and he would determine that it would have these chemicals in it this top one is glucose the middle one is uh as uh yes good oh good one all right a nucleic acid okay and the bottom one was a triglyceride right unsaturated see the double bonds okay very good. That's the one that's not very good for you, by the way. So be careful about that. So we can analyze the cake. We can look at it from the point of a chemist. We also can look at it from the point of, right, its molecular level, right? So we can have an inorganic chemist come and say, oh, instead of nutrition, what we're really looking at is protons and electrons. So I have even more detail. So I'm finding the ultimate reality of this cake is it's a bunch of carbon atoms with oxygen on them, and I can tell you where those orbitals are. Or we can even get a quantum physicist to come and apply Schrodinger's equations to them, right? So I can predict where every particle will be at a certain time, right? Now we've gotten to the ultimate reality. You can't know anything more about the cake than that, right? So is that everything there is to know about the cake? Who would know what the cake is for? Would the, would the physicist know what the cake was for? He could show you over time where every particle is, but he's missing something, right? Science is a great tool. You can make a fancy graph. You can make a great science project, but only my mom would be able to tell you what it was for. See? So it's a birthday, and your friend's birthday coming up, right? So the point of these little examples is that science is really useful. And I use science every day at work, and you guys will too. And when you're in science class, it's important to learn those things. Those are true truths. You can know something about the physical reality. But because I can describe it in detail does not mean that that's all there is. Because sometimes you ha have to ask the one who made the cake what it was for. Happy birthday, Gary. That's me. Okay. Christianity is consistent with the story told by science, but it takes that story for further. 
It tells the full story of which science is a part. Science can describe our physical world. But there is more to ultimate reality than just what we can taste, touch, see, what we can measure. Those scientists, those really brainy guys that can analyze the cake are missing something really important because science to them has become like a god instead of just a tool. Science is just a tool. Okay, that's what we talked about last time. What time are we stopping? Nine? Okay, no problem. Okay, so can we, de can we find some way to determine if natural causes can tell us if there's anything beyond our reality? Is there something more than just time and chance out there. So last time we looked at monkey head rock and we said that monkey head rock is very different than Mount Rushmore. Okay. Now if I told you that the wind and the rain made monkey head rock, you would kind of have to believe me. But if I told you that the wind and the rain made that, you would have good reason to think that I wasn't a reliable source of information. So why do we think that we who look a lot more like Mount Rushmore than Monkey Head Rock can occur by chance? Well, we're going to walk through this and, and we'll cover a lot of ground, but I think it's kind of interesting to look at. Now, this old fellow is William Paley, okay? He lived before the uh, American Revolution, old guy, but he came up with something called, tell me if any of you have heard of this before, <coughs> the watchmaker theory. Okay, you've got a we got a nodding head. What does it mean? Uh, close, close. Let's see. So we have. Oh, my my watch isn't coming up. Let's see. Oh, I missed it. It just wasn't on mine. Okay, here, wait, wait. Okay, you know, this is actually my partner's watch. He was operating, and I just had a camera on me, so I said, I'm going to take a picture of his watch. So this was actually in the operating room. I put his watch up, because his watch has all the little pieces inside. You can see it going. Pretty impressive. So what William Paley actually r wrote was, he said, if I was walking across a meadow, and I stubbed my toe on a rock, I could reasonably assume that nature had put it there. But if I was walking across a heath, that's their word for a meadow, and I stub my toe on this, this object has every evidence of contrivance. That's what he called it. And I would have to presume that these intricate parts had a maker. It's called the watchmaker argument. And I'm sorry, your name is Annie. Annie uh, kind of knew about that. And so we like to presume that that, could be the case that if we find something like a watch, it would be unreasonable to assume that the pieces could self-assemble like that. That would take a lot of faith to believe. And one of the arguments against it was, well, at that time, people said, you know, our bodies are nothing really at all like machines. But in fact, if we made a hydrogen atom the size of a tennis ball, a hydrogen atom the size of a tennis ball, every cell in your body, of which there's about a trillion to 10 trillion cells in your body, your each cell would be about the size of Manhattan Island, okay? And inside that cell would be a level of complexity similar to what you would find in Manhattan Island. There would be libraries, there would be a city hall to run the place, there would be an electrical grid, there would be subways, there would be freeways, there would be gas stations. It's very similar to what we find in our own bodies. But we didn't know that at the time that William Paley came out with his watchmaker argument, people kind of dismissed it. They were saying, no, your body really isn't that complicated. You're making an argument out of nothing. It's no big deal to have a human body. But I can tell you, in the time since then until now, we have been found that the body is a much more complex thing than we thought. And this is just an art, like an artist's rendition of what we know actually happens within your body. It is no mistake. It is no accident. The amount of complexity here, Bill Gates himself said, would completely subsume the entire amount of information available in the universe in one cell. It's impossible for you to even imagine how much information is brought together to make the city of Manhattan work in each one of your cells. So 
So is there any evidence for the supernatural? Uh, this is a human heart. It's a model of it. I get to play with them every day. And in the course of a day, the heart will pump about two big train cars full of blood. Who here has ever felt their heart get tired? Ever feel your heart get tired? You don't even know it's in there. It's doing the work. It's pumping all the time. When does your heart rest? Anybody know? Does your heart ever get a break? When you die? <laughs> yeah, your heart gets a rest when you die. That's true. But your heart is built so that it can rest between beats. It pumps and it actually rests between beats so that it never gets tired and it lasts a lifetime. It's really an amazing thing. So do you think all the brainy MIT engineers are able to design an artificial heart that can do what your heart does? The answer is they're trying. So that's the best we have right now. See that thing? It's a propeller inside a tube, and the propeller spins about 10,000 RPM, and this is something I use at my work to try to mimic what the heart does. Okay, so the heart's pumping blood all the time, never gets tired. This thing runs on batteries, and looks something like this. This is us putting one of these in. This is called a HeartMate 2, and what it is is a inline impeller pump that's battery-powered. You can see that white cable. That's how the batteries run in. You can wear the batteries, like right outside your belly, and that's the inflow cannula. It brings blood in, and it flows about 4 liters per minute. Now that's the tip of a heart, and we're about to sew on the attachment piece so we can put the inflow cannula down into the heart. See how the heart's beating there? We're, we're using machines so that the patient stays alive while we work on them. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Okay, so uh, this fits right on there. This is the finished product, okay? The patient's head is right here, feet are away, and this thing is now supporting that heart. So that the heart's still in place, but the machine pumps the blood for you. What's that? Oh. <laughs> and uh, what? It's kind of, yeah, well, it is. That's a human heart. It's a, th it's a beautiful thing. The heart is a beautiful thing. Uh, and so we make a machine that kind of mimics what the heart does. It's not really as good as the real thing. S and this is an ad from the, from the company, see? The only blood pump proven to work longer than ours, but we're getting closer. This actually, this company was a spinoff of uh, from a some engineers from MIT, and uh, it's now based in California. But what they say is that you know this is the best we can do. How many of you would guess that this pump that you just saw being put in could self-assemble itself? Would that be a reasonable assumption to make? Oh, that thing occurred, time plus chance can make something like that. Yet I can tell you that the one that those brainy guys made is far inferior to what God gave you in the first place because it's working there all the time. You don't need any batteries, right? And it never gets tired. You wouldn't even know it's there. And that's the best we can come up with. So this is some evidence we have that these wonderful devices that run your body do not occur by accident. One of the greatest challenges, now Richard Dawkins, you'll see me quote him a lot. He is a very well-known non-theist, an atheist, someone who believes that God does not exist and that we are the products of time plus chance. There is no, no purpose to the universe and we are here just by accident. So this is what he says. As he studies these types of unusual things, that is a heart or a working heart pump, he says one of the greatest challenges to the human intellect over the centuries has been to explain how the complex, improbable appearance of design in the universe arises. Do you see his tone? In other words, he's saying, how can we explain that things look like they're designed? He goes on to say this in his book, The God Delusion. Biology, some of you guys study biology, right, is actually the study of complicated things like that heart pump we looked at that give the impression of having been designed for a purpose. What's he really saying here? If it's giving you the impression that it's designed for a purpose, he's saying, I am committed to the idea that these things we're looking at, the parts of your body, have no purpose, but they just look like 
They have a purpose. We'll, we'll explore that a little bit more. Okay. Um, human eyes. You guys all, i looking around here, all of you have two of them. Uh, how many of you have iPhones? You guys have iPhones? How many pixels you get out of your iPhone? Don't know. A lot, right? It's a pretty good picture. It's if an uh, iPhone 5 is better than an old one, right? iPhone 6 is better than that, right? More pixels. I think um, my wife Cheryl bought this fancy camera, like an HD. It's got like 6 million pixels. You guys know what a pixel is, right? Each little dot. So a lot of dots means a better picture. So maybe the best camera, Cheryl, how many pixels does your camera have now? Tw oh, sorry, I'm behind the times. So we're up to 24 million pixels. That sounds really like a lot, huh? How many pixels does your eye see? Any ideas? If the best camera out there is 24 megapixels, that is 24 million pixels, how many pixels does your eye see? Any guess? More or less? More. A lot more? Yeah, like try 6 billion pixels, okay? 6 billion pixels. Now, for a static picture, that would be pretty impressive, right? But the picture moves. Now, we've got an HD video camera here. Okay, how many video buffs here? How many of you guys like got a uh, GoPro or one of those things? Anybody have one? Okay. How fast is the frame rate for HD video? Come on, some of you guys must know this, you video guys, computer guys. How fast does the picture change in HD video? 60 is like the fastest, 64, 64 per second. Originally it was like 40, but it's up to 60. It just so happens, no accident, that the frame rate change for your eye is about 60 hertz. In other words, 60 frames per second. Your eye sees 6 billion pixels 60 times a second. Okay? So that's more definition than any of these cameras can give to you. Now, there's a lot of biochemistry behind how your eye is able to change the frame rate so fast. So this brainy looking guy here, he is a prof was a professor at Harvard. Okay, his name's George Wolf. Nobel Prize winner. And he spent his life trying to describe what happens in the back of your eye to allow your frame rate to be 60 hertz or cycles per second. So do you think it's complex or really simple? Complex. Okay, you guys know this talk already. It gets really complex. It turns out that there's a chemical in there called retinol, and you can see the that's the orange one inside. And when you guys study organi organic chemistry, you'll find out that any m organic molecule can uh, orient itself in two different three-dimensional patterns, even though chemically it's the same. One photon of light, that is the smallest packet of light energy that we can measure, can hit one of those molecules and it flips it from one configuration called a cis configuration to a trans configuration like that. So one photon of light hits this molecule on the back of your eye and it flips like that. And there's six billion of these ready to go in the back of your eye at any time. The running frame rate you see there is the computer program he used to model the change. It takes 30 proteins to communicate that change to your brain and then flip the thing back to its neutral position so it's ready to go again. That happens 60 times a second. Okay, so it's a pretty smart guy. He figured all this out. When he started out in 1954, when he said, I'm going to study, this is going to be my life's work. I'm going to be a professor at Harvard. I'm going to be a big shot guy, Nobel Prize winner. He said, we cannot accept supernatural creation on philosophical grounds. In other words, I've made my mind up ahead of time that there can't be a God, that only time plus chance has caused all this. And I choose to believe the impossible, that life arose spontaneously by chance. I choose to believe the impossible that life arose spontaneously by chance. So he spends the next 30 years studying what we just described. You know what he said after 30 years? I must confess with some shock that it is mind, and he meant a supernatural mind, 
that has composed a physical universe that breeds life. He looked at his computer program. He looked at his modeling. He looked at what he described and won the Nobel Prize for. And he said, you know what? There's no way this can happen by chance. It must be a god. Now, he didn't name it as such, but he saw the evidence for it, and he uh, wrote that in the, in the journal. So is there any evidence for the supernatural? Well, an act of intelligence is required to bring even a thimble into being. You guys know what a thimble is, right? It's a really simple thing, but you can tell it's designed. Why should the artifacts of life be any different? Why should that pump that you saw us put in in the operating room be any different than that? How could it occur without an act of intelligence? Well, some of you have studied this in biology, and this is the answer that you are sometimes getting. Okay, who knows who that is? Darwin. Okay, what did Darwin say? What's Darwin's theory? Evolution, natural selection, that's good. What's natural selection? I heard somebody say that. Okay, wait, wait, I heard it. Who's talking? I heard that. Right here. Okay, sorry. Superior beings will have a higher likelihood of survival. That's natural selection. Um, you guys heard the joke, right? The two guys are running from the tiger. And the tiger's chasing him, and the one guy says to the other one, why are you smiling? And the guy smiling says, uh, the, the two guys are running from the tiger. One guy says, why are you smiling? This tiger is faster than both of us. We're going to get eaten. And the other guy smiles. He goes, no, I don't have to run faster than the tiger. I just have to run faster than you. See? That's natural selection, right? Survival of the fittest. Right. That's what Darwin no, says. So, uh, it sounds really smart, right? Uh, when do the fittest not survive? Do the fittest ever not survive? I'm sorry? Spanish flu, explain what you mean. Okay, um, you're talking about a disease where it seemed like the strongest people got the disease and died. But I can tell you that the fittest didn't survive because we define the fittest as those who survive. So the fittest always survive. In other words, to say the fittest survive or survival the fittest is to say nothing at all because you've given me no information. You've just defined what it means to be fit, which we already know. Okay, so this really brilliant active thinking doesn't really take us anywhere. Let's see what I mean by that. So uh, this is what Darwin says at the bottom. If we talk about evolution, big picture evolution, all right? And we'll talk about this more because the terms are real important. Darwin says, time plus chance can produce all the complex life, can make the heart that doesn't get tired, can make the eye that can change the frame rate at 60 times per second. Uh, all we need is time plus chance to make complex life. Well, as we've studied how complicated life is, how much information is in your DNA, which is six billion base pairs, more information than the Encyclopedia Britannica in every one of the cells in your body, okay? Uh, we see that, ooh, if, if we stretch out the DNA that's in your body, in all your cells, if we just stretched out the chemical, the DNA that's in your body, do you know how long it would be? Would it stretch from here? back to the back of the room, here to Portland, or here to the sun? Who said that? To the sun. You must have read the book. It's true. Our DNA has so much information in it that it's impossible to think that it occurred by chance. And our friend Dawkins, who I've been telling you about, said, you know, it's, it's obvious that if Darwinism were really a theory of just chance, it couldn't work. There's no way that your that heart blood pump that you saw in the operating room can occur by itself or that the watch can self-assemble. That's asking the impossible. He says, you don't need to be a mathematician to calculate that an eye or a hemoglobin molecule would take from here to infinity to self-assemble by sheer higgledly piggedly luck. Can't occur, but he says, even this is someone who is not a theist. He's not a god, no god. I believe in Darwin. He says it couldn't occur by chance. But he says, Darwin has an ace in the hole, has an ace up his sleeve. Hmm, he says, what's he going to have? Well, you guys already talked about it. Can't occur by 
just chance? Maybe not. The answer must be, wait for it, natural selection, of course. So how does natural selection work? Let's see if it's going to do it. Uh, somehow the movie got moved. Oh, what do you think is going to happen? Huh? This is natural selection at work, right? So, well, do you feel sorry for the Ibex there? Don't you feel sorry for the for the the poor uh, cheetah there? What if he's hungry? You think he's hungry? Yeah, he's going to be hungry. Oh yeah. Sorry, we're a little off axis here, but you get the idea. Ooh, ooh, oh, we got him. So. It's natural selection, okay? Natural selection always means somebody dies, okay? Natural selection means somebody dies. Uh, what that's saying is that natural selection does not innovate or create. Natural selection only destroys. Natural selection cannot create information. Natural selection only destroys information. If you leave evolution in these terms by itself, it can only degrade, it can only get worse. It does not create anything, it only destroys. So, evolution, we see, big picture evolution now, does not account for complexity, and we're going to see it does not account for origins. Now, we'll get into that in a second, I think we have time to do that. But this is real important, guys, because people ask me at work when we get, we get in talks about this. They say, well, do you believe in evolution? And I, I, you have to ask, what do you mean by that? They say, well, it's proven fact. Natural selection occurs. Who thinks natural selection occurs? Of course it does. That's different than saying that time plus chance explains everything. Okay? Because I agree that natural selection occurs. How do I know that? There's no dodo birds left, right? The dinosaurs are gone. Natural selection has occurred, no question. But that's different than saying that these unguided processes can, can account for what we see in biology. You follow me? So be careful about that. There are some aspects of evolution we know occur. Things die. But there's a reason why people don't believe this, okay? Who knows who Yuri G Gagarin is? Yuri Gagarin. Yeah. Couldn't hear. First Russian cosmonaut. First man in space. You know what he said when he they shot him into space? That's what he said. He said, I look, that's not him, that's an American guy. I couldn't find a picture of Yuri Gagarin. <laughs> but he said, I looked out the window. I looked and looked, but I didn't see any God up there. So God must not exist. You shot me into space. I look for God. He's not here. There's no God. What's the problem with that thinking? He assumed that God is up there. We know that God is everywhere. But he's looking for the wrong things. He's thinking that God is going to give him evidence that he wants. But more importantly, we're going to see that he really doesn't want to know if God is up there. But it's important for us as believers to follow the evidence wherever it goes. We know that as we study science, it will point to God. The things of this world are but signs and pointers. We must let them lead us to their source. Okay? The ground rock, bedrock, incontrovertible, non-negotiable principle of science is cause and effect. Things don't happen for no reason. Right? Science always has cause, effect, cause, effect. So let's look at that a little bit more. Who can tell me, give me a definition of time. What is time? Pretty hard, right? It's hard to say what time is without using the word in the definition because something has to happen. Don't feel bad if you can't describe it because nobody can. Nobody really knows what time is. To be honest, neither scientists nor philosophers really know what time is. Now, Paul Davies is a professor at uh, Arizona, famous uh, scientists, he doesn't really know why, what time is or why it exists, but God made it. Now, let's look at this on a uh, diagram. Let's say that 
time that there was a beginning here. We know that there is a beginning for two empirical reasons. One is, just like your rooms in the course of a school year, we get more and more disorder over time, right? Your room does not naturally pick itself up. You have to put energy into it to clean it up. If you leave it to its natural state, what happens? Your mom yells at you because it's a mess. Same thing with the universe. Things wind down. And we can measure the available energy that the universe has it always goes down, never goes up. The other thing we know is that total energy of the universe is constant. What do those two things tell us? We can talk more later about why this means, but it means that there was a beginning. I'm not here to tell you when the beginning started, the pink line, but it's definitely started at one point in time. Universe popped into existence uh, and does not have infinite time backwards. There was a beginning. Okay, who's that? Einstein. You guys all want to grow up, be like him, right? Be like real brainy, like Einstein. That was our joke in medical school. The, the dumbest kid in class that couldn't get it, we'd call him Einstein. Okay, come on, Einstein, you can figure this out. Well, Einstein, his theories allowed this graph to be made. And people understood that from his theories, which were being proven in empirical experiments, that the universe had to begin. And this happened in the first half of the 20th century. Scientists didn't like it. We don't like the fact that every evidence points towards a beginning for time and space. Why don't we like it? Because it looks a lot like God. We don't like that. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. That's the ground rock of science. Here we have an effect, but we have no cause for it. So I don't like it. So Einstein actually modified his theories. He went back to his paper, and he added on some fudge factors in. Just, just I'm going to write it in because I don't like where this is leading. And then all the experimental data started going wrong. And he said, this is the greatest mistake of my professional life, to go back and try to change it, to make it look like something I wanted it to be instead of following the evidence. As believers, you and I don't have to be afraid of where the evidence goes. It's, gonna point, it's going to point to God. Okay, who knows who that is? S who's Stephen Hawking? Anybody know? Some brainy guy, right? He's got cerebral palsy. Who saw the movie uh, Theory of Everything? Nobody saw it. It's okay. I don't think it was that good. But this guy's brilliant, right? He holds the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge, which is the same chairmanship that Isaac Newton had. Okay, he's a really smart guy. So he wrote a paper in 1970 that established him as a scientist. Do you know what he said in it? The singularities of gravitational collapse in cosmology. Sounds really dull. I'm dying here. Don't I can't bear it, but this is what he said. This is the conclusion. If mass exists, that is, if anything exists, and general relativity, that is, Einstein's theories are correct, if those two things are true, then space and time must be created by some causal being, right? Because we see the effect. There must be a cause that transcends or operates outside of space and time. Think about that. For this is Stephen Hawking now. Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge. If mass exists, if the world is out there, if this is a reality and Einstein was right, then space and time must have been created by some causal being that transcends or operates outside space and time. Hmm. His colleague, Fred Hoyle, also an astrophysicist, looked at the fine-tuning of the universe, and he said, it's as if a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. You guys got any candidates for a causal being that transcends or operates out of space and time and is a super intellect? Any ideas? Any candidates for that? Interesting. This is what we're taught in school, though, right? That we know Einstein's theory said if we had to start from nothing and there was no time, nothing. It's hard for us to imagine nothing, right? We 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 can only think about our own reality and it's hard for us to imagine there being no space no time no mass nothing our minds rebel we're unable to think of that but if there's nothing plus nothing no time plus nobody what happens what are you going to get everything right 
the whole world. Everything created, you and me, came out of nothing. Does that make sense? This is Hubert Spencer. He's a uh, physicist from around the turn of the century. He said, I'm going to describe the totality of the universe. And everything that's out there can be described by time, force, action, space, and mass. Can you imagine anything that isn't some derivative of time, force, action, space, and mass? Time, force, action, space, and mass. Let's think about it. What does the Bible say in the first verse? In the beginning, time, God, force, created, action, the heavens, space, and the earth, mass. In the first sentence of your Bible, God laid out the totality of our physical reality with himself transcending that. This is what the scientists are finding much, much later. Time, force, action, space, and mass. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. The totality of what we experience, God breathed into being, just like we looked at in Psalm 33 at the beginning. He gave his word, and it was done. And the scientists are just coming up to this right now. We see evidence of this all the time. <coughs> God created from nothing. That's exactly what Stephen Hawking found when he studied the universe, applied Einstein's theories to it, and said, you know what, we started from nothing. The Bible anticipated that, not because it was a lucky guess, but because God, who created the universe, knew the reality and put it in there in truth. The Bible, the Judeo-Christian tradition, is the only ancient cosmology, that is theory of where we came from, that stands up to the glare of modern science. When we march forward in science, this word still stands up. It's not true of the other holy books out there. So we as believers can look forward to knowing more about the universe and not be afraid of what we're going to find. We have reason to trust and reason to believe what is true. We have conviction based on reason. That's what our faith should be like. And when we break into small groups, we'll look at Hebrews 11, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of not seen. We believe not despite evidence or in the absence of evidence, but because of evidence. Now, Arno Penzias is a Nobel laureate. This is what he said. He discovered the background radiation which is left over from the Big Bang. And he worked for Bell Labs in New Jersey. I mean, something good came out of New Jersey, okay? This guy found it in, in Bell Labs. The best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. So there are smart guys out there who study God's universe and say, you know what, this is just what the Bible predicts. And they put it together and say, there's no conflict here. My faith is bolstered by evidence. And the Bible confirms it, anticipates it, and is the book that God told us about. So in the beginning was the word. Those of you who have Bibles, let's turn to John 1. And we'll close with these thoughts. And we're so familiar with this. It always sounds like Christmas time, right, when we do this? In the beginning was the Word. Where have you seen this type of thinking before? Genesis 1.1, right? In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. Let's see what it says. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In the beginning, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. What do we learn about the word? Let's just talk about this word here. In the beginning was the word. The word was there in the beginning. In the beginning, God created, right? That time period, before there was no time, God is eternal. There's a point in time when God set everything into motion. And uh, someone asked John Calvin, who's a famous theologian, right? What was God doing before he created time? What was God doing before he created time? Do you know what he said? He said, <laughs> creating a place to send people like you who ask those questions. <laughs> now, I hope he was half kidding with that. But in reality, we know that God, the three in one, had fellowship within the Godhead. 
God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. He had no need to create us, but for there was activity. There was something going on before we existed in our present reality. But Jesus was there. The Word was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was there at the same time. The Word is eternal. The Word was with the Father. Okay? The elements of the Godhead, the God three and one, was there at the beginning. That's what John 1, 1 is saying. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word is God, and Verse 3, all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The word is creator. The word is creator. God is working through the word and is the word to create what you and I are and what we see. Further, in him was life. The word is the giver of life. Isn't that interesting? Now, what is this word? What are they talking about here? The word was with God. The word was God. The word's eternal. The word is the creator and the giver of life. It sounds pretty important. This word sounds pretty important. It turns out, and I'm not a Greek scholar. I'll leave it to Caleb for you guys to figure this out. But life is a very special thing. It's hard to even describe. You and I are alive. This chair is not alive. This tablet, although it does a lot of things I can't do, uh, like remember things and flip upside down when I do that uh, is not alive but God is the giver of life it's a special gift we can make chemicals we can make robots who's been to Disneyland and seen this robot anybody seen him it's made by Honda of all things have you seen it It's pretty amazing how it walks and it talks and you think it's almost human but there's something about it that's not life we all know what real life is like okay this is not the current dog, by the way. That's the previous dog. But still, when we see the puppy, we know that there's something different about the puppy than the chemicals that are laying out in the parking lot. In fact, you could take all the chemicals that make that puppy, rearrange it as long as you want. You will not get the puppy. God is the giver of life. There's something special about life. And we cling to it. We cling to it. This gentleman is a person that's very special to me. And he had a big heart attack a number of years ago and was dying. He was 40-some years old. And we put in two machines, like the ones you saw on the video here, to keep him alive while we look for a heart transplant for him. Okay? And his whole family was there. He was a, fami he was a local politician, actually very famous in this area. And I... We tried to keep him alive. We had the two machines going, and he started getting a fever. He started getting weak. And I thought, he's not going to survive even if we find a heart transplant for him. And I prayed to God. I said, I don't know what else to do. I think we have to let him go. And I was walking out of his room to tell his family that we have to stop, and his life is going to be over because it's futile. We can't do anything more. And as I was walking out, I was about to talk to them. My beeper went off. And there was a donor for him. And I told him, this is risky. We can try. We can try to do this. And we transplanted him. Nine days after the transplant, he was ready to go home. He was physically fine, doing great. Another, it was a miracle. And he was on the side of his bed. He's crying, tears coming down. And I sat with him. I said, what's wrong? This is in the evening, and my wife's getting mad because I'm not coming home. But it's okay. I'm going to talk to him a little bit. You know what he said? His life was empty. He had this gift of life. He didn't know what to do. And that night he accepted Christ as his Savior. And now he, he quit his job and he works at the, with disabled youth. He's done it ever since. This is his 20th anniversary party for life. We got to see him. There's something special about life. We cling to it. God gives us that gift. We're different than the chemicals that that are made up. You know, if we melt you down, do you know how much the chemicals in your body are worth? If we were to melt you down, you know, you have a little gold in your body. Did you know that? In your tendons, there's gold that holds it in there, some arsenic, some barium, some bismuth, and some trace elements that are quite valuable. You're worth about 20 bucks. <laughs> okay? If we were to boil you down, that's what you had. But see, but only God can take that $20 of chemicals and make you what you are. That's what's special. 
and we we want you to remember that God is the giver of that. It's not um, something that occur by chance. So we'll close with this. Look, this is the word, right? The word that is eternal, the word that was with God, that is God, that created all things, and that is the giver of life. Well, there's two words for this word in the Greek, in the original Greek, and it really means something. I know I get tired when someone starts talking about the Greek. It doesn't mean anything, but this one does. The word that John used in this passage is the logos, L-O-G-O-S. And in ancient Greek times, this word logos meant the life force or vital force that guides all rational thinking. It's like the unifying force in the universe, this logos. And the way they termed it was, the logos was like, what is it that keeps the river in the riverbed, that keeps the river from running off? The logos is the defining rationality behind the entire totality of your reality. That's their word for the word. So we translate it word, but it's, a, it's, it's shallow compared to what the Greeks meant it to be. That's what Jesus is to us, the creator, the eternal one, the one to whom all history points and the one that we should worship. So I'll stop there. Um, any questions? A lot of things to look at. In your small groups, we'll be able to break this up a little bit better, but why don't we close with prayer then? Lord, thank you for being a great God, for being the one who caused all to be. And, and even as we marvel of at what you made, Lord, we praise you for being so personal that you would send your son to die for us. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in your creation. Thank you for making us and sending your son to give us a relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray.